Yo les amis, c'est Baki187. Aujourd'hui, on se retrouve pour une vidéo très spéciale. Il s'agit tout simplement de la vidéo de l'interview de James Sobar. Alors, pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas James Sobar, c'est tout simplement le créateur de la BD The Claw. Car The Claw, avant d'être un film, c'était d'abord une BD. Euh, D'ailleurs, dans quelques jours, je vais vous proposer une magnifique vidéo. Donc, c'est ma collection de tout ce qui concerne euh, l'univers de The Claw. Donc, les, le vinyle. Euh, des figurines, les BD, les DVD, enfin toutes sortes. Et ici, j'ai rentré le DVD donc collector, donc le double collector, euh, qui est sorti en 94, voire 2000 je crois, même sans pas l'époque le DVD est sorti en 2000. Le film est sorti en 1994 au cinéma. Donc c'est un film qui était euh, avec en euh, acteur principal Brandon Lee. Tout le monde connaît à peu près Brandon Lee, enfin, je pense. Pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas. <coughs> Excusez-moi, c'est tout simplement le fils de Bruce Lee. Euh, cette famille-là a connu quand même pas mal de déboires parce que le père, donc Bruce Lee, est décédé dans un film. Si je me rappelle bien, ce doit être La Fureur du Dragon. Euh, soit disant, une balle à blanc qui a été remplacée par une vraie balle et enfin bref, il est décédé comme ça. Et son fils également est décédé dans le film The Claw. C'est ce qui fait aussi que ce film a une, une intonation très particulière, une, une atmosphère très bizarre parce qu'en en fait vous allez voir au début du film euh, ce que vous voyez au début du film en fait ça a été tourné tout simplement à la fin à la fin du film et à ce moment là Brandon Lee était déjà décédé c'est et il y a d'autres petites polémiques par rapport à ce film d'autres euh, comment dire ça euh, d'autres faits très bizarres comme par exemple la script du film et le réalisateur du film qui ne se sont plus vus pendant des années après le film parce qu'ils ils habitaient pas dans la même ville voire même pas dans le même pays et eh ben en fait ils sont décédés le même jour, à la même heure, donc, donc dans des pays différents. Enfin ils sont décédés, en fait ils se sont suicidés. Et on a retrouvé exactement la même lettre chez l'un comme chez l'autre. Alors qu'ils n'avaient plus de contact du tout. Donc franchement ce film est resté cultissime par rapport à tout ce truc. Et aussi parce que c'était un excellent film. Donc je vous dis à tout de suite après le générique pour cette magnifique interview donc, du créateur de The Claw, donc de la BD The Claw. Quiet down here. What? We need it to be quiet. You telling me to shut up? I'm telling you not to be banging shit around or turning the TV on. Have a good evening. Okay. I started drawing as soon as I could hold a pencil or uh, crayons more accurately. I, uh, I was, really didn't care for the, the illustrations that were in my coloring book, so I would do my own on the on the backs of the pages, and uh, it just kind of carried on from there. I just never stopped. It's like I never go anywhere without bringing a notebook and a sketchbook, because you know I'm sitting on airplanes or in cars or something. I'm trying to work out a, a scene or a pose or something, or you know writing out a, a, some dialogue uh, scenarios. But I probably have you know like. A hundred of these sketchbooks that are just, you know, full of things from, you know, um, 15 years worth of stuff. I'm not like a typical comic book artist where it's like I get a, somebody hands me a script and then I translate that onto images on the paper. It's like pretty much everything I've done has been, you know, I've been the, the writer and the creator of it. And it has to have some kind of personal... I know, personal attachment for me to be involved in it because it takes so much out of me to do this, you know, it's like every single line on that paper comes from me and every single line on there is there for a purpose, you know, none of it's, uh, you know, none of it's just eye candy, everything has a meaning on there and, and because it's, it's so draining and it takes so much out of me, um, you know, something has to be worthwhile for me to, uh, to me, for me to invest that much emotion into it, so... You know, all the projects that I've done, um, you know, have been like a real personal statement for me. And there are things that I've done for myself, nothing, 
nothing has been, you know, f for just purely entertainment value. Um, you know, for a long time I thought it was kind of like a therapy or like working out all my problems or angers or frustrations out on paper. <clears throat> you know, and it was a lot cheaper than uh, seeing a therapist or something. I was born in a trailer and uh, I got, actually got taken to the hospital like sometime in the next week and my birth mother was, was so drunk and out of it, she couldn't remember exactly when I was born. It was between Christmas and New Year's, she said, so they, uh, they made my birthday January 1st. I'm the, I'm the New Year's hope. You know, I spent my, my early formative years in, in an orphanage in foster care. Uh, I didn't get adopted till I was about seven. And so I spent, you know, a lot of time with a large group of kids and uh, with very few uh, parental figures. And then when I did um, go out to, he loaned out to these, some families on the weekends, it was never for very long. And, uh, and a lot of times it just wasn't a very good situation. I mean, some of these people shouldn't have been allowed to have pets, let alone uh, children. And I think of, there was a lot of monetary uh, incentive for these people to do that type of thing where they, you know, they would get $100 to take a kid for the weekend. So, um, so when I was younger, I found it was best to just, you know, uh, be quiet, you know, don't draw attention to yourself. Just kind of uh, go over into the corner and uh, entertain yourself for a while and try not to... Uh, Try not to bring anything bad down on yourself. And in fact, I'm sure some of these families uh, that I went with thought I was retarded or something because I never said a word and I uh, didn't interact with anybody. I just kind of stayed to myself. So, uh, so uh, as a result of that, I didn't have very good communication skills when I, uh, as I grew up, and uh, and as a result of that, I uh, I learned to express myself uh, on paper. And which has worked to my benefit since then. I never had any formal art training at all. Everything was kind of self-taught, and I, uh, I, uh, I learned my anatomy not from comic books, which is like a major failing of the uh, of the artist day. It's like they, you know, they learn from an exaggerated picture, so they're like doing an exaggeration of an exaggeration, and so it's twice removed from life. And uh, the muscle structure is like completely wrong, and uh, and the figures just have no weight, or they're you know they're not solid and so I actually learned to draw from like Michelangelo statues um, just you know uh, classic sculpture um, um, paintings from that era I, uh, you know I just I kind of worked at it and worked at it and um, you know if I had trouble with one area like hands and feet and uh, faces are typical areas that most people have trouble with you know, I would just work on those continually until I thought I, I had them down to where I could put it in any position uh, and it would work and it would look lifelike and uh, I could I could make it do what I needed it to do to tell a story. Believe it or not, I got like a failing grade in art class. Um, I had one of those foolish instructors who, I mean, um, not to not sound arrogant or anything, but I was like so far ahead of everybody else that, that the, their typical assignments were just like things that I had done when I was a toddler, you know, and so I just could not, could not bring myself to do that. I mean, I was doing these, these big epic scenarios while everybody else was drawing a cone, you know, and, and because I refused to kowtow to this, this, uh, instructor and, you know, do his basic first, first grade, you know, three-dimensional stuff, I, uh, I ended up getting a failing grade, which kept me from, from, um, placing higher on the, on the graduation list, but I mean that wasn't anything I was concerned with at the time. My adoptive parents were, uh, were you know, blue-collar, hard-working people from down south. They didn't see art as, uh, as any type of career. It was uh, just kind of a hobby to, uh, to waste time with, you know. I think they, they thought uh, drawing was the equivalent of playing cards, you know. It was just something to do. and. Uh, I don't know, it kind of reached an apex in my teenage years where I was forbidden to draw in the house because I was wasting so much time and uh, I was told to go out and get a real job, uh, which I subsequently had to do, you know, washing dishes at a restaurant or working at the uh, nursing home. And uh, for a long time, I just I wasn't allowed to draw in the house. I would have to go to the library or 
do it at school. You know, just in secret. Up until I was like 16, I kind of felt like my life was this endurance test that I had to get through. It was like, you know, well, what more could be thrown at me? I kind of felt like God had his elbow on my neck my whole life. And it was like I just had to get to the end of it. You know, I had to, I had to get to the end of the race and then, you know, then good things would happen. And when I was 16, I, uh, I met this girl and she was like an angel to me. I mean, she was just, you know, absolutely everything I had ever wanted. And I thought, you know, well, I, you know... I did it. I got to the end of the race. I got, you know, you know, for uh, for not caving in, for not surrendering, for you know, fighting through that 16 years of uh, of difficulty. I finally got to the end, and I, you know, I've got, um, you know, I've got the prize. And she was like the exact opposite of me. I was, you know, dark and brooding and sarcastic and uh, really venomous and everything. And she was like. Just like this bright white light who was always happy and I never heard her say a foul word or a, a word against anyone. Um, you know, if I would, uh, if I would like verbally attack someone, she would point out their good points. And so it was like we, uh, I don't know, it was like positive and negative. We just kind of fit together perfect. And it was just like a, a perfect balance. And, you know, and, and everything that I had found, you know, um, wanting in, in human nature, she... You know, she would point out the positive aspects of it. So I, uh, I don't know, I was really enamored of her. And I just, you know, it was like meeting someone and I just could not find any fault with her at all. And, uh, I don't know, she was just like a shining light in my life. And we were together for like every day for probably three years. And, uh, we were engaged and we were supposed to be married after, uh, after we graduated. And, uh, and she was killed by a drunk driver. And, um, and I was like pretty much just destroyed. I, uh, you know, every, everything that I had, had worked for, had been working up to was, uh, was wrapped around this person and suddenly she was gone for, for no good reason. I mean, uh, you know, it's not like she had an illness or, or, um, uh, it was something that was anticipated just like one day out of the blue. Um, you know, somebody decided to get drunk and, uh, drive down a side street at 70 miles an hour and, uh, and suddenly she was just gone. You know, I don't know if I actually believed in a God, but if I did, then I really felt betrayed by him. That, uh, you know, why, you know, why make this beautiful, perfect flower and then, then just trample it afterwards? You know, what, what was the point in that? What was the meaning of that? You know, I, you know, I almost felt like I was being punished, you know, like I had, I had finally been shown this thing and, and allowed to hold it for just a moment and then it was taken away just as, you know, like a bitter joke and I, uh, um, you know, I, I definitely lost my, lost my faith in, uh, in human nature for a while there. So I spent, you know, like, um, uh, probably three years after that doing really self-destructive things, uh, just furious with life, um, just kind of charging through it, uh, you know, when I was little, when I was a kid, I used to play this game in the, in the bathtub where I would try and keep all the water on one side of the bathtub. You know, which is pretty much impossible, you know, it just can't be done, but <clears throat> but it was a game I would play, and I kind of felt like, you know, that's what I was doing in my life. I was just trying to keep everything bad and evil and everything that would destroy me back, and you can only do that for so long before you tire and you, and you realize it's futile. There's no way you're going to be able to do that forever, and um, there's never, it's never going to relent. It's never going to stop, so... Um, you know, I finally realized that <clears throat> I was going to have to channel all this into something or I was going to self-destruct. So I decided, well, I'm going to, I'll find this vehicle, which was the crow, to, um, to vent all this anger and frustration and rage. Um, so, um, so it became my therapy for a long time. You know, I would work eight or ten hours a day. Uh, at a dealership or on cars and uh, then come home and draw till two or three in the morning and just get up and do it again um, really had no kind of life other than that um, just putting in time but uh, gradually I just uh, I don't know I think music had a lot to do with it I uh, actually found some musical groups that I uh, felt like were really speaking to me or spoke for me that uh where somebody actually understood what I was feeling and uh and validated it you know 
uh, Joy Division. Uh, Joy Division being a main, a main influence on me, and their uh, their influence is really prevalent throughout the whole the whole uh, Crow book. And Eric was was typically just a vehicle for for my emotions, but I uh, was never really comfortable with drawing myself, so I. Uh, um, worked up this this character this figure that was it was kind of Peter Murphy's face visually and in Iggy Pop's uh, physicality his his kind of body and movements uh, real lean um, kind of a uh, cat like Shelley's like a, just a literal translation of uh, of Beverly nothing nothing much had changed you know I tried I even kept kept that 70s hairstyle and just, just kind of tried to capture her, uh, her innocence and that kind of uh, white light quality that I saw. And it was, it was difficult to do. It wasn't fun. Uh, it was a lot of times it was like picking at scars, reopening old wounds. And as a result, I could only do so many pages at a time before I'd have to stop. And, um, and because of that, it took almost nine years for me to finish it you know I could only do it in like 20 page increments and then I would have to stop that's yeah. why the, the chapters are usually you know only from three or four to, to ten pages long in the crow because um, that was particularly how I did the sequences and and I the way I work is that I have to kind of do everything in one setting where I don't stop or I don't get up or quit until I'm I've got to where I want to go otherwise if I stop and you know and come back the next day or a few days later I'll start finding things wrong with it and I'll talk myself out of it and I'll find a hundred reasons why I don't like it um, and so I just uh, don't allow myself to stop and, and start critiquing it otherwise you know I would just find fault with everything and never finish anything the creation part of it is what is important to me it's like uh, it's like I have this image in my head that I want to get down on paper and it's, uh, you know, if I can get 60% of that down on paper, then that's a tremendous success. Um, you know, I've, I've, I don't think I've ever, uh, ever gone beyond that. If, uh, if I get to that 100% mark, then it's probably time to quit. But um, I was just, you know, for paintings hanging in galleries or hanging over a sofa or something, that was just never important to me. It was never the finished work. It was just, uh, you know, getting what was in my head down on the paper, which was important to me. So I finally finished it, you know, like in the late 80s. I started, I th think I did the first page in like 1981. And, uh, and I didn't finish it till like 1989. And it was basically something that I just did for myself. I had no intentions of publishing it anywhere. I never showed it to anyone. It was just, uh, just this vehicle for me to, um, you know, this cathartic type thing that was supposed to be helping me. Virtually everyone in the book is based on a real person. Um, people I worked with or people I knew. Yeah, Fun Boy was kind of uh, a cross between Iggy Pop and Jim Carroll. Um, Jim Carroll being another another uh, 70s uh, poet singer that I was uh, influenced by. Um, he, he was from New York and uh, very much part of that 70s art scene there. But really, really um, nice strong lyrics. Um, in fact, even had like a semi-hit song here in the U.S. with uh, people who died. You know, and all the names were from graffiti. I had taken off uh, buildings in Detroit. Just, you know, different street corners that are in the book are actual places. Uh, in fact, I didn't I didn't make up any place. They're all they're all real places or were at the time uh, places in and around Detroit. A lot of them have been cleaned out or. Uh, mowed down because of uh, uh, Detroit just had legalized gambling okay in the last few years and they really cleaned out a whole whole section of the ghetto for these uh, big casino buildings. People have this image of Detroit as like a, a really dangerous you know uh, anything could happen type city. It's funny you know I go some places and I you know I'm down south and I tell them I'm from Detroit and people like will literally take a step back or you know they definitely take you a lot more seriously. Uh, you know, people always ask me, why do you still live in Detroit? And it's, well, you know, this is where I grew up. This is where my friends are. I know where everything is. This is where I'm from. So I have no desire to, to move anywhere else. And, uh, 
you know, and Detroit has some history in it, you know, and it has that kind of uh, negative connotation to it when you say you're from Detroit, which is which is always fun to carry around. I mean, you know, you don't get that when you say I'm from Pittsburgh. You know, in, in comics work, I really like to do just pen and ink, and uh, and I really like black and white as opposed to colored work, in in mine especially. Um, it's not like I think in black and white, or you know, I only watch black and white movies or or anything like that. I just uh, I think a lot of the uh, the power in comics is is in the the line work and the and the ink work, and the color just kind of kind of detracts from that. I mean, when I'm doing paintings, that's a, that's a whole different technique for me. I mean, uh, you know, oil paintings and um, watercolors are uh, are definitely a, a whole breed apart from comics. And I tried to do like these dream sequences and the flashbacks all in uh, all in wash or watercolor to um, just to give it a softer, dreamy feel. My cheap Kmart watercolors, since I was uh, poor. Before growing up, I had to use the most inexpensive materials I could find, and since I uh, learned how to make those work for me, I've never really changed. You know, I, I do on occasion buy you know some of the, the more expensive tube paints, where Kmart's can't really match their color intensity. But for the most part, I've learned how to make the cheap stuff work for me, and uh, don't feel any need to change. Uh, in fact, I've had the same drawing board since I was 15 years old. Um, as you can tell by looking at it, it's got a nice crust of ink and paint all over it. I actually bought it uh, when I was like 16 from the, uh, the first jobs I ever had. I was working in a, in like a senior citizen's old folks home. You know, I never had so many mothers in my whole life. You know, son, son, take me out in the sun take me out in the garden. You know, they, everyone was in wheelchairs, and so I used to push them around and stuff. And uh, share cigarettes with them. And well, I used to share cigarettes with them until um, one time after I'd been sharing cigarettes with this like 75 year old man for a week, uh, one of the doctors come, came up to me and said, don't give this man cigarettes, he has syphilis. And I'm like, well, yeah, I've been sharing butts with him for a week now, I'm glad you told me. I had been working on cars for like 12 years and I was just totally tired of it. Um, it's like, you know, once I'd learned how to do something, I just got bored with it and I wanted to move on to something else to learn something else. And uh, I had, you know, after like six years or so of working on cars, you know, doing body work and framework and stuff, I just, you know, I didn't feel, feel like there was any more I could learn and I wanted, I was like, I don't know. 30, 30 years old, 31, and I just wanted to do something else that was challenging where I felt I could learn something and I could throw myself into it. And, uh, I don't know, just like on a whim, I, I tested out for, uh, for medical school at Wayne State and I placed really high in it. So I, um, uh, I just, on Friday I was banging on a car and on Monday morning I was sitting in a classroom and Wayne State is tremendously expensive. So, um, after after two years, I had to go back to work, and uh, so I went back to work at a body shop. You know, my intent being to work for another year or so, and then then go back and uh, to take some more classes. But in the in the meantime, the uh, the comic book stuff really started to take off for me. I was doing T-shirts for a comic book store to help pay for my books and things, and uh, the owner of the store. Um, liked my work and he actually asked if I had any uh, comic strips at home um, and so I I don't know just on a whim I kind of took that in and showed it to him and uh, he really liked it and he asked if he could publish it and that was kind of how uh, Caliber Comics was born he uh, he had he owned like two or three stores in the Detroit area and there were all these other comic book artists or would-be comic book artists living in the area who would come in on Fridays and get the new comics and he saw all this talent coming into a store that wasn't really doing anything. And uh, so he decided to start a publishing company. And uh, The Crow was one of the one of their very first books and it was uh and it sold amazingly well. And uh, and I actually uh, got to the point where I thought I could make a living at it, you know. I uh, I looked at my income from the uh, from the body work and from the uh, from the comics work and they were uh, just about neck and neck and 
I figured, well, there, there's no reason for me to get up and fucking skin my knuckles every morning on somebody's car that ain't mine, you know. I, I, when I could go down there and do what I actually like to do. After, like, um, three issues, I started getting offers from, like, film companies and studios and things that were interested in it. Um, which, <clears throat> I was really surprised that it, it didn't take very long for them to latch on to it, but... I mean, I always saw it as a film, you know. In fact, when I was, like, laying out the pages, I did it in storyboard form. My dad was a bus driver in Detroit, and he would, uh... I would go to work with him, and he would drop me off at the theater, and I would sit there and watch, you know, the same two horror films all day. And then he would pick me up on his way home. So, uh, spent lots of weekends down there. I'm definitely influenced a lot by film. You know, when I'm, when I'm drawing comics, I'm thinking of camera angles, and, you know, I'm thinking of where, where do, you know... Even though I'm drawing, you know, I'm actually thinking you know, where I'm placing a camera. But you know, in in um, in reality, the camera is just my head. You know, where where I'm looking at a scene from. Typically, you know, comics in that respect work just like film. You know, if you uh, have the camera uh, um, far away from the uh, uh, from the figures or the action, it tends to isolate it and make it um, more formal and less intimate. And comics work the same way. If you push in on somebody into a close-up, it uh, it adds more immediacy to it, and it makes it more informal. Uh, so in that respect, you know, comics and film are, are really similar. You know, and um, on the other hand, comics, you know, comics are a lot different than film. Uh, whereas, you know, um, time is one thing where where um, uh, you you can't really guide the the reader on how much time to spend on each picture when he's reading a story, so typically you have to like to slow a page down. You have to put more panels in it, more pictures, so they have to spend more time reading it. Um, you know, put more dialogue or or more caption balloons on a page to uh, to keep them on that page longer. Or um, if you want to speed it up, you use a lot of big panels like on the action sequences. You know, I typically do you know three three or four big panels or splash panels which is you know a whole panel and in some instances I even will do a double page panel which is stretched over two pages um, so and and the other big difference between comics and film is sound I mean in in comics you have these big uh, big sound effects you know plastered across the panels and you just have to hope that the reader is going to accept those and, and, you know, and kind of like sound them out in his head. You know, actually what you're asking the reader to do is act it out in his head. You're giving him like the visual cues and you're asking him to act it out in his head, supplying the actor's voices and the sound effects and things. And you're just kind of giving him these visual cues to work from. You know, whereas in film, everything is just kind of presented to you and put right in your lap, you know, complete with background scores and, you know, um, you know, and uh, digital sound and, you know, everything else. I had no aspirations about becoming, uh, you know, involved in film or anything like that. I thought, you know, for the most, they'll have it for, have the option for two or three years and it'll lapse and then I'll get it back. So I, you know, I never even thought it would get made to begin with, uh, let alone that fast. I mean, within like two years, it was in production, which is just phenomenal and amazing. And at one point, uh, one of the producers in a meeting, one of the producers said, and this is no joke, he literally said this, um, I know, we can do this as a musical, we can get Michael Jackson to star in it, and we can get Julian Temple to direct it. Um, and, and I thought it was, I thought it was a joke, I, you know, I started laughing. But he was completely serious, and that's how it is in, in Hollywood, it's like, you know, it's like there's this beautiful tree, and, and every dog that comes along has to piss on it. And it got to the point where I was like, you know, what, what the hell? Why do you even buy this thing when you want to completely change it into something unrecognizable? You know, why don't you just come up with your own story? Why do you, why do you even bother with this if you're just going to try and change everything? And it got really, really far away from what it was supposed to be at one point. Uh, and then when uh, Alex Proyas and, uh, and Brandon came on board... Uh, they were uh, both huge fans of the comic and insisted that it be taken back to to what it was in the beginning, and uh, and Brandon especially he was really enamored with the books, um, a big fan of the books, and uh, was really instrumental in getting it, uh, getting it as close to the uh, to the comic as it is. 
Um, and, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, Brandon and Proyas are what made the first film. Um, they're the, the two real stars of it. I think, uh, I think uh, back in the 30s, somebody asked Raymond Chandler, you know, what, um, how do you feel about what Hollywood has done to your books? And he said, fucking Hollywood hasn't done anything to my books. They're right on the shelf where they've always been. And, uh, and that's kind of how I, th I think about my stuff, too. It's, it's separate from them, you know, it's, uh, it's never going to be, um, be what they want it to be. It's never just going to be something pure and entertaining. It's always going to have, have to have a personal statement for me in it, otherwise I, I can't bring myself to do it, you know. I, uh, as, as much as I try to, to turn myself into a whore, a comic book whore, I just can't seem to do it. I can't seem to squeeze out a Spider-Man story or an X-Man story. I just, uh, I just can't find it in myself to, uh, to uh, invest that much time and energy and emotion into it. So I just have to keep doing what I can do, what I'm good at, and, uh, you know, and hope I don't get stale or uh, start repeating myself. You know, my father, after he died and I was uh, sorting through all his papers and things, I found some of his old check stubs where he had made, like, you know, two thirty an hour for, uh, for years and years. And I was just amazed that he could um, support a family on wages like that. Um, and I, I had a new respect for him after seeing that stuff because, uh, you know, growing up, I knew we didn't have a lot, but I never felt wanting for anything. And... Um, and now I then then I understood why he used to work, you know, 80, 90 hours a week. And and, and because of that, you know, I never uh, I never had a father that I played catch with or went to baseball games with or things like that. He was just uh, some guy that would show up, you know, at dinner time and uh, then go to sleep and he would be gone before I woke up. So I mean, most of the uh, most of the um, time I spent with him was when I went with him on his bus routes. So, but he was, you know, he was a good person, and uh, he never complained about anything. And in that respect, I, uh, I try to be more like him. My wife's having a baby here pretty soon, a girl, and uh, yeah, I'm still, you know, even though, even though I'm 40 years old, I still feel like I'm a teenager. I'm happier now than I have been since I was 18. I'm. Uh, you know, I'm really glad I didn't decide to to just give up and uh, and accept things as they were. Um, I mean, there was a great temptation to to just give in to everything for a while there, and I'm really glad I didn't know because uh, by not just accepting the way the way things were and to, and to keep fighting, to keep pushing back all that negativity, it uh, it did finally pay off for me. Where to where I, you know I I feel like I have everything that I wanted that I've wanted my whole life, and uh, and I can enjoy my life now. I don't feel like um, I'm going through some endurance test or uh, I'm waiting to get to the end for the good part. You know, it's like, this is it now. And yeah, unfortunately, the, the world is full of those, uh, um, those people that, you know, who are in that same position I was where they don't feel like they have a whole lot of hope or that things are never going to change. And uh, I'm glad that they... Uh, they can get out of my work that there, you know, uh, that there is some light at the end of the tunnel, that there is some hope, and that, you know, this uh, true love thing does actually exist, you know, that it is obtainable, it's not just an ideal. And, uh, and I really feel sorry for people that have never experienced it, or they just, you know, they don't understand it, or they think that's like some ideal that they're never going to reach, because it is there, and it is possible. And, you know, and I actually feel lucky that I've, you know, I've got it again or approached it again. You know, I've, uh, you know, when, uh, when I met Karen, I've, I, you know, I kind of fell in love like I did for that very first time. And it's, uh, you know, I feel really lucky for it, so...